And thank you so much, Mark, for being here and giving us this kick in the feet to get us started in this sprint. Thank you, Lars. Uh, it's, it's really, it, it's tremendous to be here with all of you. And I, this has been a year for me of making new friends. And <clears throat> Lars is certainly high among them, but everybody on this call, uh, whether you're an older friend or a newer friend is really, really important to me and really important to what we're trying to do. And I see a big piece of my role as I am later in life, as connecting everybody and making sure all of this uh, continues. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to go through a presentation. I'm going to go through it quickly. I encourage you to ask questions and comments as much as you can in the chat as this is going on. You can interrupt me if you so desire. Uh, but I'd like to just sort of go through it all just so you have something in place in a recording that's there that you can refer back to. So uh, I look forward, here I go, share my screen. Um, does it wanna do that? Uh, share, no, stop share, share where? Share screen, this is the one. Okay, so I'm talking about empowering kids as you all know. Um, let's make sure it works. Yes, and, and I'm writing an upcoming book. This is really a lot of the things that are going to be in, in the book. Uh, I, we don't have a final title, Empowering the Humans of the Future. Uh, from uh, Diana, I added a subtitle, Insert Your Dream Here, which I, I know will appeal to Heidi, uh, because it's really about that we can, we can realize our dreams much more than in the past. And the book starts with this quote, which just I got very recently from um, a, a friend of some of us, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez, who's a well-known consultant, a very good guy, who said, I recently had an epiphany. Today is not going to be changed by old people. It's going to be changed by young people. And so that, to me, is really what we're talking about. We're here to help. We should all be here. Uh, we could all, if we want to, change our our name tag on our picture to record our age as well. And if we did that, we would find that we are probably skewed a little older than younger, but we have some young people. We have Diana, we have Leo, we have some people that I know are here and I encourage us to have more in the future. So this was the question Lars sent out. It was a good question. I had sent him some questions and that's really what we're trying to think about, but I look at it more like this. How can you tell an empowered kid from an unempowered kid? Because it doesn't matter what we do. It matters a little bit what we do, but really what matters is the result that comes out. Do we get empowered kids and how do we figure that out and how do we measure that? How do we know that is happening? And my answer, you all have an answer to this. My answer is these are kids or people who get things done and they get them done with measurable positive impact, something that we can actually look at. And we have several ways to look at that. We could look at it. My favorite way is before and after. See that? Last year it was bad. Now, because of what I and my team did, it's much better. There's impact. That's what I'm talking about. You tell empowered kids, in my view, by their accomplishments not by what they achieve, not their degrees, not anything like this, but by their accomplishments. I don't care about reach. This is a perhaps one of my first different perspectives. A lot of people these days count reach. We have reached a million kids, a thing. We got two billion kids. It doesn't matter that we reach them. What matters is that they have impact as a result of our reaching them. And that's what we should count. Reach is not, a, my view, a, a useful metric at all. I know a lot of funders look at it, but our new metric for me is measurable positive impact. And why do we have to do this? This is new that I've come up with. <laughs> what we do for kids is lame. <laughs> it's learning and it's aimed at the mess, which is math, English, science, and social studies, and at eventually getting a job and employment. That to me is lame. It was good in the 20th century. 
There's nothing, it was fine. It was maybe the best we could do in the 20th century, but now it's lame. And the reason it's lame is that learning turns out to be not an end in itself, but a means. We learn in order to accomplish useful things. So that's really where I want to focus. That's what I encourage us all to focus on. Yes. Um, and my advice, I'm going to have a few pieces of advice as we go on, is don't measure reach. Don't even necessarily think of it. You can count it. It's fine. But don't tout that as something that's really, you know, that you're doing well. Measure impact. Really show things, whether they're stories or whether they're, they're things you can point to. And if we don't know how to measure impact, which is probably true, we should figure it out. We just shouldn't go and use a proxy like reach or something else. We have to figure it out. Do we count accomplishments? Do we look at before and after? I think there are multiple ways. So our kids live in new times. That's why we're here. We know that they can accomplish much. I think everybody has seen that. So I encourage you to think huge. Not, I was gonna say big, but I mean huge, like Bernie Sanders would say huge. Uh, it's time to really go beyond. And what we should not do is just incremental and limited thinking because there's plenty of that in the world and it's not enough, it's not helping us. My metaphor for this in education is the cake and icing metaphor. It's, we have in education and generally in bringing up our kids, a stale, lame cake. Things that we have done before that work, but that are going stale that don't work today. So you'd think we'd build a new cake. That would be the best way or bake a new cake, but that's not what happens. What happens is we just stick more and more icing on the old stale cake. And icing is my acronym for incremental changes. So I advise very strongly that you think about this in whatever you do and don't just make icing. Even though we have all our kids in schools and that's the easiest way to reach them and a lot of people say this, if we, all we do is put icing on the old system, we are not helping the kids. None of that lasts, none of that becomes really important. It's really a waste of our time to make icing, in my view. But what are we trying to do? What are our goals? My goals, personally, and you may have your own goals, are a better world filled with good, effective, world-improving, empowered people. I would love that to be our world. And what I try to do, and this is from a long time ago now, I try to imagine what a 21st century upbringing not necessarily in education, but a whole upbringing of kids from infants to, to workers and beyond, what would that look like if we started from scratch? If we just started with the kids of today and the world of tomorrow in mind and didn't have any baggage on our backs from the past, what would we do? So for me, that means we gotta ask, What's new in our times? And obviously we know that technology is exponential. It's becoming universal. It's becoming integrated. I, I won't go into technology in a huge way, but in some way I will. What you may not be, or as many people may not be aware of is that beliefs are changing. And I will go into that in a big way later on. What's new is that kids, and I mean all kids everywhere, even if you're uh, in the, the poorest parts of the world or war-torn or anything else, you can accomplish useful things that kids could never do before. And if I had more time, I'd go into that in a big way, but there's a database, which I started creating a long time ago called bwwdatabase.org. And if you go to that, you'll find a lot, over a hundred projects, and I always wanna add more. Uh, so that's something that you can look at on your own. Oh, freaking hell. Do you, the, do you want to see that again? If you do, yeah. I hear. 
btwdatabase.org. Btwdatabase.org. Btw is better their world. Okay. The biggest thing is that dreams can come true. That to me is the hugest difference. That's what draws me to Heidi with her dream tank. And, and uh, I think that the idea of dreams is going to be much, much, much bigger in the future because the kids have these new capabilities and these dreams really can come true. I was just talking about this with my kid yesterday who had, he told me, oh, I have this nice idea for a, a product. I said, well, you can build it. You can patent it. You can make it happen. So that's, and that's going to be universal. And as a result of that, our kids are not just sitting back, but they're starting to stand up and they're ready to have a say. We kept them down for a very long time. We looked at our kids as, as workers or as pets or as something that they weren't, but certainly not as equals. Now they're ready to have a say as equals. And I have been to a lot of conferences where they so include, quote, student voice, but it's not as equals. It's there in a separate room. They're this. They're not at the top of all these organizations. I think we have to to start doing that. And I hope we'll get more young people to join us because our kids are becoming generation empowered. This is new, it's different, it's something that is universal and that we are encouraging and trying to help. But of course, if you say that, you have to say to what end? And the end, sorry, I'm checking the time here. Um, the end that I'm talking about is not just the lame end of learning aimed at the mess and eventual employment. That is lame. But I have thought about what the new end should be of bringing up people in the world. And I've come up with a, what I call a far better solution. This is a little bit uh, corny, perhaps, and I encourage everybody to help me refine it. But here's what it is. I think we need to help our kids find their new beliefs, their unique value, their new connections, and their new 20th century powers. That we have to start very early, and that's uh, what we could do perhaps even starting in preschool, what we now call preschool. But we're doing it for a purpose. The purpose is so that we can apply those things to accomplishing with positive impact. And that we can do that when the kids are young. That's what we're talking about of projects and startups and all these things. And as well to meaningful work that creates and adds value to humanity all their lives. That's, and we need to talk about, I don't go into it a whole lot here, but what creating and adding value means for people as they do meaningful work. But thereby, what we really want to do, the reason we're doing all these things is so that people can realize their positive dreams, realize them for themselves, realize them for their families, realize them for their world. So to me, that's a far better way to look at it. And if you think of it as lame versus far better, which would you take? So Empowerment to me, and this is going to be the, the rest of the presentation a lot to a large extent, comes from a combination of four things, empowering beliefs, real world accomplishments, applied uniqueness, and tech and team symbiosis. And I'll talk about each of these things. But what really counts is that we all have a crucial choice to make for our kids. This is, you know, this is a group of parents, among other things, not just parents, but even kids have to make the same choice. Do I want to go backwards? Do I want to go forwards? And as Lars said, I think we all want to go forwards, which means not just trying to fix the past, but to try to create the future. If we want to fix the past, we can keep and innovate within academic education. It exists all over the world. If we want to create the future, we'd better create new choices alongside academic education, in my view. And that means if, you know, if we stay with the past, we keep the schools, we work in the schools, we innovate within the schools, 
We add things like technology and social emotional. We discuss things like the future of learning, which is a big deal for some. And we talk about how we can improve the mess, math, English, science, social studies. If we're going to create the future, we need to focus on something new. I love the word empowerment hubs that somebody here, Leo Wolfel, coined. Uh, and I think that the Planet Pilots is adopting already, uh, which focuses on empowerment and real world projects and creating imaginers and doers and having impact. I don't think we can have it both ways. I think two things will exist in the world for a long time, but I don't think we can fix education. I think education will go on at its own pace. There's a ton of reasons adults want it, adults believe in it. We all know what it is. The new things don't really count. Nobody wants to experiment with their kids. It's a, it supports huge numbers of people in the world. It's legitimized by PISA. There's no consensus on really where to take it. It's very self-protective. And what change pressure there is, and there is some, is typically only for the icing that we talked about. So I don't think we can fix that. I think we should just let that go on its own route and uh, offer a better alternative that hopefully will take over because it is better for so many people. Now I hear, the biggest objection I hear is, well, if you do that, aren't you just throwing out the baby with the bathwater? And my answer to that is, well, yes, we need new bathwater because we have a new environment, but we also have a new baby. We have these new empowered people. And that's what makes it different why the old system is not effective anymore. But for a lot of people, a lot of parents, and you're all going to deal with other parents. It's a hard choice to tell them not to go back. Why is that such a hard choice, I've asked myself. And it's very much my answer because of their beliefs. They are every single person born who's, who's over the age of 21 today was born in the 20th century. I call us, and I'm one of them, the last pre-internet generation the world will ever see. And our beliefs were formed in the 20th century. Some of us have moved a little further, but most of us haven't. Whereas the kids are the first internet generations the world has ever known. They're connected in new ways, we'll talk about that. And their beliefs were formed from what they saw in the 21st century such as the events of a few days ago at the capital of the US. And this is from a neuroscientist, uh, which is really important, which says that all of us think we see the world objectively, but beliefs totally influence our perception of the world. And so what's new in our times is kids with different beliefs, empower what I call empowering beliefs, and I'll talk about them. Kids who see the world and act in the world differently, either already or potentially. And I see a new beliefs divide emerging in the world. And I'll tell you, show you some of the elements of that divide, which are the most important one is that kids have little power, because we did the 20th century, we didn't, couldn't do a whole lot of things that adults could do. But now kids are powerful. And we all know why, and we'll see more of this. So it used to be that learning was the key. And that was true. But now accomplishing is the key. It used to be that kids needed to get a lot of specific knowledge and skills from the adults, because we were the only ones who had it. And it was in the books and we, the teachers told the kids what was in the books, et cetera, et cetera. Now they need empowerment and choice from us because all that other stuff is available online if they need it. And so an old belief is that education, and this goes back to what Lars said at the beginning, is important and necessary. But the newer belief is that while some form of educating kids or bringing up kids well is important, 
school may not be the best way. And here are more. We used to think mastery was so important. You had to master a subject before you could do anything. Sal Khan is even bringing that back these days. No, accomplishment comes first and you master things by using them, by doing them, by context. There's a lot of people who still say technology is a tool. Humans are humans by themselves. We just have these different tools that we can use. No, technology is becoming a part of us. It's a part of the kids. You can see their attitudes towards having it being ripped away from them. We used to think that do your own work, individual work matters. Plagiarism was the worst sin you could possibly commit in the academic world. Do your own work, don't cheat. Now it's all about networking and collaboration and almost none of us works alone. We, a lot of people still think that in-person is better. If you can look someone in the eye, if you can touch them, if you can do this, if you can see them, that's better somehow. I think where we're headed is that that still exists, but online is now an equal partner. And which you do, which you use in any situation is totally situational. The only thing we need people in person for is to hug them. Everything else we have to decide whether we want them in person or not. And so in education, we're seeing a big change in beliefs from learning to accomplishing, from bettering yourself to bettering your world, from learning to learn, which a lot of people now talk about, learning to learn is such a big thing. No, it's learning to accomplish. We don't just want to motivate our kids, we want them to apply their passion with impact, not to motivate them to learn what we have to teach them. We don't wanna focus anymore on high grades and rankings, but on getting things done. Academic thinking, which has dominated our schools for so long, is gonna re be replaced by using thinking, thinking doesn't go away, using it in the real world and so many people are saying from the 20th century, oh, we don't know what's coming because in the 20th century we did. That was why adult guidance was so useful in the 20th century and before because it was just gonna be more of the same. And so now that it's changing, we have to be ready for everything and anything. What's interesting to me is that belief change is what creates the future. Because if you have all the new technology in the world and everything looks different and you still have the old beliefs, you don't really have a different future. But belief change is happening today and it's happening in a huge number of areas, not just in education, but in all these areas, which I'm not gonna read to you, but you can look at and this is incredibly important. It's, these are ideas that I formulated with, with cultural anthropologists and very little attention or not enough attention is being paid to this in my view. But I did take a stab at writing a book about what beliefs might look for, look like for 21st century kids. This is, these are my ideas. Uh, it's online there again, there's the URL that you can use to uh, look at it. I'll leave this up here for a couple of seconds. And I'll show you some examples from that book, a couple of the pages. It's a very short book. This is the first one. I'm a member of the human race and a citizen of the world before my many other identities. I have a unique set of dreams, passions, strengths, and capabilities that no other human has. I can understand my uniqueness and apply it to bettering my world in my own way. I have the power to create positive change as an individual and more powerfully in teams. That's Greta, as you all know. Uh, so that's the kinds of things, and this book exists. It exists on a, a new site that, that now Lars and, and Justina are familiar with called Our Books, and kids can create these books on their own, and we're going to translate it into as many languages as we can, and we're very open to input in terms of changing it, especially input from kids. 
But what I believe, what's really important, is that the beliefs divide is now more important than the digital divide. That's really saying a lot because we all know about the digital divide. We all know what it is. I think the beliefs divide is more important. And I'm going to come up with a number of challenges for this group, for everybody as we move forward. The first one is how do we instill the empowering beliefs in kids and get rid of the disempowering beliefs that adults are bringing to them from the 20th century. Or in other terms, how do we find new ways? How do we find ways to bridge that beliefs divide so that everybody is positive, happy, and moving forward? So another thing that we all know is new in our times is this universal connection. Everybody's getting connected to the internet with aorta, which is my and Mark Anderson's term for always on real time access, which means it's always there. You don't have to worry about it or connect to it or do anything. It's there. And you are then also connected to every other person on the planet. That is brand new, of course, in our times. The biggest implication of that, from my perspective, is that it redefines community. We are so used to, because it was true for all of human history, that community are the people living next to you or the people in your own household or the people, whatever it is. That's what community means. And each community set itself up in its own way. That is co-location. Community was defined by co-location. That is now changing because there's a new way to define community, which is affinity. Who do you want to be in your community? You know, if you grew up in a dysfunctional family, you don't feel like that's your community. If you grew up in a dysfunctional culture, you may not feel like that's your community. Your affinity group is now able to be your community. And there's a wonderful line from my friend, uh, James Paul G, who says, with the internet, every person in the world can now find a group in which she or he is in the top 10%. So you can find those people. They may not exist in your community. And what that means is we have to invent new forms of collaboration. We really don't have good forms. Zoom is just a proxy for what we used to do, which is be in the same room, right? Um, I call it from the, that famous festival in Colorado, I call it the ass pen. We would put asses in seats listening to people on the stage. And the, that's not what we want. Even this is not what we want. Breakout rooms, boy, is that an old metaphor smog for small groups or whatever it is. We need, desperately need new ways. And the challenges are two. The first one is to connect everybody, which is fortunately going on through the big tech companies and people, governments waking up to this need, but equally important, refining what those connections imply, inventing new things, because they don't imply the same things that they did when we were only connected in person. What else is new in our times? Accomplishment with impact. This is something we couldn't do before. And we're seeing poster girls now. And if you haven't heard of Jitanjali Rao, you should. She was the, the Times Magazine Kid of the Year. Uh, she created something to, to help measure lead in water. Uh, Several years ago when she was 11, I put her into the database then. Now she's created more things and she's a great example. And she's got an idea of observe, brainstorm, research, build, communicate, which is very similar to feel, imagine, do, share and other methodologies that people are inventing to help kids. Is Greta the poster girl for change? We don't know yet. She started with old fashioned methods. She started with the 20th century methods of standing in front of a building and protesting in the rain. 
She went to the 21st century methods of talking to large groups through broadcast media and the UN and stuff like that. She's now moved on to some 21st century methods of connecting people and getting these Friday meetups happening around the world. Has she produced results and impact yet? We don't know. The jury is still out. But that's not what's important. What's important is that this be done by all kids everywhere. And that's what that database is all about, is about kids, whether they're in India or Asia or Africa or, or South America or North America, uh, they are all doing this. They are all becoming empowered. And we need to know about that and understand that they all can. It's not just the people at the top that we recognize. So I see the challenge really is empowering not just the bright kids, and we all gravitate towards the top kids or the leaders. We all gravitate towards that. There's huge numbers of organizations that say, we want to find the leaders. Well, that's not enough. In fact, we're moving. I haven't made any slides for this, but I think we're moving from the pyramid model of the leaders and then things go top down to a much more peer-to-peer -peer model. And so it may not be as necessary to find and identify and cultivate leaders, but to really think about all the 2 billion kids everywhere in the world. One way to do this is to start with what we mentioned before, empowerment hubs, which we're seeing here at, at Planet Pilots, which we're seeing uh, Leo is starting his own and we can start lots of them. They'll be very different. Sorry, my typo. Uh, and they are going to be, I think, valid alternatives to schools. They may have a different name, but that's the kind of thing that we're after. Because it doesn't matter anymore that you just have the right beliefs or the good passions or you found your passions or strengths or skills. You have to apply them. Application, accomplishment, and impact are the keys. Achievement is not going to count. It doesn't matter what degrees you have. Those are achievements. They only affect you. They may get you into another place. But accomplishment with impact is really what counts. What else is new in our times? Unique value. Remember, in the world, we used to, we, people have always been unique. We're all homo sapiens, but every one single homo sapien is unique in many ways, particularly in how they think. In the past, we would stratify people, but typically by social classes. And within those classes, we would try to make everybody the same. We would ignore the differences. You know, one slave was like another slave. One leader was like another leader. No. Now we're starting to see that we have more equality, that we have diversity by culture. And that's the way we mostly do diversity now. We think, well, if you put people together, not because of the look different, but because of their cultures, they think differently, then you'll get some good results. But I think it's gonna go much further. I think we need to talk about the unique value that each individual brings to a team and to the world and that the individuals need to recognize that and apply it. So the challenge is helping each kid find and apply his or her uniqueness to creating and adding value to the world. And there's a lot that we can do in terms of reorganizations, in terms of thinking about who creates value, who adds value, in terms of thinking about leaders, leadership and followership and building new kinds of teams, et cetera. I encourage you to do that. And now I want to talk about this new thing that I've been thinking a lot about, which is that we're becoming symbiotic with our new technological capabilities. That there are new parts of our body that as 21st century humans, we can't thrive without they are becoming very much like the bacteria in our gut or on our skin. Those all live outside our blood system, our internal body, but we can't live without them. And so here's what's what I see going on. Already, 
our machine parts, not just machines, but our machine parts are better at reading and writing and accessing and all those things that are in that column. Not that we can't do them by ourselves, but we would be silly to try to do them without some machine assistance, without being able to look up a word when we don't know it on our phone, without being able to put the trivial stuff like sports scores online without involving people. All of those things already, we've come to the point where our machine parts are very important. Machines certainly have more agility than grit and grit than humans do. On the other side, on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a lot of things shifting. So I don't know if you've seen IBM Project Debater, but you should because a machine, Watson, can beat a human at a formal debate or come close. Critical thinking, which we a lot of people say, oh, that's what we need today. A lot of that is aided by machines and project management and system thinking. And you may agree or disagree with these characterizations. Uh, art and music are becoming mach totally machine enabled. And even conversation, like my kid talks to Siri and relating. So what does that leave that humans are better at, the human parts are better at? Not that humans are better. This, is, I, this slide needs rewriting because the human parts are better at loving and dreaming and imagining and feeling and respecting and empathizing and ethics and compassion speaking and creativity and uniqueness and especially at accomplishing. So this is something I think is really important for us to think about. And the challenge, and I think this may be the biggest challenge for humanity of all, is to positively integrate 21st century technology into human beings. That's why when we take kids' phones away at the door of a school or in our homes, we are literally cutting off a part of their body. And that's why they protest so much. They can get used to it, but why should they? And all these things, beliefs change, accomplishments, unique values, symbiosis, they all go hand in hand. They all have to happen at once. And so the challenge, and this is like the challenge of the theory of everything, we need to help the kids unite them in their minds to understand how their beliefs connect to their accomplishments, connect to their uniqueness, connect to their symbiosis. Last thing, new ways to work. So we now need to take kids past just school into the workplace. And I won't go into this a lot because of time, but we're seeing a huge move away from jobs what are the jobs of the future? What's the job that you used to hold for your whole life? To projects from jobs we hate because that's really what most of them are, or at least that we tolerate, to real meaningful work for individuals. From, as I mentioned, the pyramid organization, the top down, the leaders and the followers, to the peer to peers and the networked organization from workplaces to empowerment and other hubs, from old kinds of teams to new teams, like we may have teams of value creators and value adders working together. Somebody is talking in India about mass entrepreneurship. This is something uh, Heidi might be interested in. And we may need to move to not just measurable positive impact, but measurable positive value and help people understand how they add value to the world. So the challenge here is to invent a variety of new ways and new work systems that include all, all the people in the world that have meaningful work. And that brings me to the end and I'll actually finish this in the, in the time frame we have which is that my overall perspective is that it starts with empowering beliefs. That if you don't have that, you might as well not do anything else because nothing will change. It's belief change that creates a different future. 
and that we have a huge divide in beliefs and that that is actually more important for our kids and for our future than the digital divide, which will soon go away, where everybody in the world will have at least the minimum that we have now. Now, of the beliefs, the most important ones for empowering kids are I can and we can. And that's what Design for Change, for example, has done. And she talks about injecting the I can. Um, she calls it a virus. That's not a good thing to talk about anymore. But injecting that into kids, or and more importantly, we can, because it all happens in teams. So I ask everybody, and I ask you to ask yourself, on which side of the beliefs divide are you? And not just, it, it's not a big block. It's on, on various things. Where do you stand on, on empowerment? Where do you stand on beliefs? Where do you stand on symbiosis? Where do you stand on uniqueness? Because our role, as I see it, is to help move our kids forward. Remember, the kids are going to do it themselves, but our role is to help them move forward to 21st century empowerment and beliefs and accomplishments and impact. So this is my word that I wanna leave you with, Excelsior. For those who know Latin, it means ever upward. And that's the motto I think we should all adopt. And thank you very much for listening. That's my email. I hope to hear from every single one of you. I'm very happy to discuss these ideas. They're not set in stone, but they really depend on your input. So thank you very much, and let's talk. Thank you so much, Mark. Big round of applause. Thank you for the words.